Good morning and a warm welcome to the Institute for Advanced Studies. Today is the third event of the lecture series, Scholarly Correspondences Among Orientalists during the early and late modern period as a historical source. One aspect that is important to us is to look at the possibilities digital scholarship tools can open up to explore the material at hand. And this is why the series is co-hosted by Near Eastern Studies and Digital Scholarship here at the IAS. And with this, I pass the word to my colleague, Maria mercedes Tuya from our IT department, who is in charge of digital scholarship here at the IAS. We're yeah. glad you could join us. And uh, let me just add some housekeeping rules at this point. Um, we ask that you keep your microphones muted um, to avoid this, um, any distractions. And we will be using the chat for questions or comments. And feel free to, to add them during the chat or uh, during the lecture or at the end of the talk. And now I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Ernst Help, who joins us today from Hong Kong, which is also the reason why today's talk takes place during the morning. Ernst Help is a freelance writer, writing among others for the Swiss online portal Republic. And currently he's working on a monographic essay on the transformation of the Asian art scene in times in the, of the rise uh, of China. To, uh, until 2020, Herb worked for 15 years uh, as the Asia correspondent for the Swiss economic publication Finanz und Wirtschaft. Prior to this, he worked for a decade as a freelance journalist writing for the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, Die Welt, Swiss Broadcast Corporation, Finance and Wirtschaft, and others on the Middle East, being based in Cairo and Tehran. In 1994 and 1997, he was also a part-time part lecturer of journalism at the American University in Cairo. Today, Ernst Herb will talk about Leo Strauss' letters to the Arabist Paul Kaus, between the search of the hidden truth and exile in Mitzrayim. Ernst, the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, let's let's start. Uh, oh. Yeah, let's start. Thank you very much. During my somehow rebellious formative years back in the seventies and eighties in Switzerland, <laughs> the name of Leo Strauss was an heard of. Also, Herbert Marcuse, Hannah Arendt, or Theodor Adorno, who escaped in the 1930s and 40s like Strauss from the raging anti-Semitism in their Heimat. I came across the name of, uh, of Strauss when I moved in the 90s to Middle East to work as a journalist. Uh, sometimes the name popped up, we didn't pay much attention. Then, of course, it came uh, uh, 2001 with the, the, uh, the murderous attacks in, in the United States. Uh, all of a sudden, when it came to the, the vigorous uh, response America launched there, there was the question of uh, kind of the architects of the invasion of Iraq would be kind of uh, Straussians. Okay, so the, the name became uh, a familiar household. Then when I moved exactly 20 years ago to China, uh, it was just the beginning of the incredible boom of the Chinese economy, which at that time when I moved there was sm smaller than that of France. Now it's, it's uh, seven times the size. It's now uh, approaching the size of, of America. Uh, again, the question was, who were the people behind it? Obviously, it's the Communist Party in China. In China. And what sometimes what, what was said is that in Chinese uh, Communist Party ideology in the schools, they're reading actually uh, Leo Strauss. That's uh, my, uh, how I remember him, the name. Not much what he did, but the name was always there. It is, of course, always baffled me that two political systems that find themselves in two so different ideological camps are influenced by the writings of the same author. That is why last year I stopped short when I literally stumbled in an archive of venerable private archaeological institute in Cairo over a folder that held letters written in the mid 1930s by Strauss to the break Parkborn Arabist Paul Eliezer Krauss. 
How did the correspondence of such an important Western thinker like Strauss end up of all places here? With this question came all of a sudden life into the yellow papers that I held in my hand, in my hands. While he was not quite in the movie, in the movie Indiana Jones, where a long last steel has been found, but there is nevertheless some enigma associated with these papers. After all, the 1899 born Strauss believed he had extricated from medieval Muslim and Jewish philosophical texts hidden, or as he called it, uh, esoteric meanings that drew in his eyes a golden bridge to Plato's absolute truth. Krauss, in his turn, who was born five years after Strauss, thought in return that he discovered in 3,000 five-year-old diplomatic notes they were dug out from the ruins of the heretic pharaoh's Akhenaton's capital, Tel Alamarna, evidence that the dating of the Pentateuch goes much further back, the Pentateuch, the, first, the five first uh, chapters of the Bible, of the Old Testament, goes much further back in time than previously believed, and this with far-reaching historic and political consequences. And the place Strauss' letters are kept now is also emanating a certain aura of fascination. The Schweizerische Institut für Ägyptische Bauforschung is the successor of the Institut für Ägyptische Bauforschung and Altertumskunde that was founded by the German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt, who in 1912 made in the already above mentioned Tel Amarna the spectacular discovery of the bust of Pharaoh Akhenaton's wife, Nefertiti, that remains the splendid centerpiece of Berlin's Egyptische Museum. Akhenaton reigned Egypt from 1353 BC onward by worshiping, solely, by worshiping solely the sun, he is considered sometimes to be the founder of monotheism. When the bust of, as some say, the world's most beautiful woman ever, was first publicly displayed in Germany, and the already existing Egyptomania was virtually turbocharged. turbocharged. Without this euphoria, Thomas Mann would probably not have taken on in an 20s, mid 1920s, the Old Testament story of Joseph and his brothers was squarely set in the Amara period. Likewise, Sigmund Freud's The Man Moses and the Monotheist re, uh, Religion, published in 1938, arguably his most daring theory put forward. Let me say at this point a few words on Strauss's yet unpublished letters before I will dwell on the question of how they could affect it to the author's later work. To wind things up, I will speak about Krauss, who in his time had been considered one of the most prom promising scholars of Semitic languages, but who today is outside a small circle of experts of medieval Arab alchemy and chemistry almost forgotten, or at least ignored. At the very last, I turn to the question of how the letters could have found their way to the present home in a grand villa overlooking a Nile in Cairo's posh island of Samalek. And here I hasten to add, uh, you add, I speak, not, I speak here not so much as a scholar uh, of, but as a journalist. So my remarks are very much a first draft that waits for a more deeper digging scholarly work. So I hope I can learn from the comments and criticism that come after this talk. Before I meander via, via the letters to the life and work of the two men, let me give credit where credit is due. First to the German scholar Maya Skrabacik, who in 2013 published under the title Von der Semitik zur Islamwissenschaft und zurück, an extensive study of the life and work of Krauss. Razul Namazi, on his side, contributed with the study Leo Strauss and Islamic Political Thought, published last year, a better understanding of Strauss's indebtedness to Arabic falsafa 
that is very much in the center of the dial dialogue taking place in the letters in the letters here discuss. This is an awkward point. Taking that Straussianism, Straussianism has a, in large parts of the Middle East, at least since 2001, become a somehow controversial ideology. But, the, but Namazi points out that the man himself was deeply respectful of Islamic philosophy. Quote, Strauss was among those who entered into dialogue with the writing of Islamic figures as products of a remarkable think of, of remarkable thinkers addressing universal questions. This said, let's have first a look on the more formal side of the letters, postcards and loose pages, some of them typed, most of them handwritten. The readability of the, la of the, of the latter varies from item to item, on the times sheer, it is sheer impossible to, run, to read. That is far as I understand, maybe not so much because the writer switched from French, German, easily from German to French and then to English and then back all again, but also so because Strauss stood as an intellectual exile at this particular moment in life under enormous stress. And you don't need to be a, a graphologist to understand when this man was like kind of lost his home and he, he, he was uh, moving between Paris and England had no uh, no no future I mean professionally uh, but he could continue to intensely work during his time and obviously moving with his, his languages places obviously he's, it, it affected obviously his handwriting that's just a detail uh, the understanding of some of the letters becomes not easier since they are not at times interspersed with words written in Arabic and Hebrew script. Strauss communicates with Krauss in an almost cryptic form that only the two kindred spirits could fully comprehend. It is as if they wanted to leave behind them hidden messages that only great minds can understand. Maybe similar as medieval masters did with, them, with their hints in their manuscript to Klaus and Strauss. Well, with that, I want to say that this correspondence is a great gift to future generations of scholars. Before looking into the times, extremely urgent matters brought up in the letters, let's have a closer look at the scholarly discourse found in the letters. To sum it up in just one sentence, Strauss struggles at that time together with his friend and colleague Krauss, with the contradiction between religion and philosophy, and find, thanks to the writing of the 20th, 10th century Muslim thinker Al-Farabi and the 12th century Jewish sage Moses, Mohan, Moses Maimonides, a way out from narrow traditional religious beliefs to the wide world of sharp Athenian thought. The core idea that he laid out that this fully 1950 in the Hillel House Lectures series titled Jerusalem and Athens. He must have early on be aware how radical his ideas were, as can be read in a letter dating August 27, 1938, where he tells Krauss that Maimonides was in fact a deist who considered, and here quote, Offenbarung als Priesterbetrug, or in English, revelation as sacerdotal fraud. To this he adds a few lines later, es ist ja nicht nur von historischem Interesse, dass erkannt wird, dass der größte Mann, den das Judentum seit Abschluss des Talmuds hervorgebracht hat und, und der das Judentum gründlich kannte, sich für Aristot rück, rückhaltlos so he basically says here, uh, Maimonides uh, did not, he was not a believer. He was like, uh, he, was, he, was a, he was a philosopher uh, who was a, cl a clear logic. Uh, not, he was not uh, grounded in, 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 the, in religion anymore. These findings are, of, cor uh, of, uh, of course, a stepping stones to the well Walgreen lectures held 1949 at the University of Chicago 
that were later published as the book under the title Natural Right and History. By the way, you can read, you can listen to it. It's about six hours. In fact, these lectures are on, on YouTube. You can, it's very interesting how, the, how he's engaged by the students when he gives these lectures. His students have the time problems to, to follow. Uh, but when you understand his, his background, you quite you get quite quickly to understand. The, 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 this idea put him squarely against the central tenets of his old friend Gershom Scholem, the great 20th century erudite of the Kabbalah. Strauss fights this battle against Scholem not alone, as a letter from September 11, 1937 shows. Quote, un jour, tu auras à faire une attaque vigoureuse et, espérons-nous, victorieuse sur cette construction, construction irosolimitel, which means uh, uh, Jerusalem, en de basant sur les dressoirs manuscrits que personne ne connaît. Aux armes, citoyens de la cité platonicienne, formez vos bataillons, suivez vos chefs arabiens et maïmonides. Contra vous la tyrannie de l'obscurantisme mystico mystique. So he was a, a complete, I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a beautiful language. He has an incredible, in German and French, uh, an incredible command. He is very witty, but this witness cannot, uh, does not hide. He was a very aggressive, extremely aggressive language he uses here to attack uh, the, the thinking of Scholem. The appeal, as we later will see, this appeal to Krauss, as we later will see, is for Krauss full of ominous omen. The both passage is not only remarkable for the determination it plays, but mostly because it reveals to what great extent the philosopher Strauss depended, at least at this particular moment, of his journalist girl, uh, journey on the knowledge of the brilliant linguist Krauss. This can be seen in a letter from August 28, 1938. Deine Antworten sind hier eine große Hilfe. Herzlichen Dank. Immediately follows on these, to, the, to these words of gratitude, another request for assistance, this time on the deeper meaning of the Arab word Tanis. So he works here, it's a little bit, uh, it's not unsimilar as I remember my good old days uh, when I studied philosophy. Uh, before I changed into the uh, more vulgar form of writing of journalism. So kind of this is like a little bit Heideggerian way, you know, to play with words, you, you, you combine things. And of course, you, the more you do, you, you, you can extricate somehow the meaning you want to hear. I don't say that he, he did that, but that's what uh, one thing that came to my mind when I read this. The correspondence reveals not only how strongly the two men's hermeneutic endeavor fused, but beyond that, how deep their personal friendship went. This should be kept in mind when one reads Strauss's work today. So Strauss is very much also Krauss. The bond became even stronger after Krauss married in 1937 Strauss's sister Bettina, who a few years earlier had been a student of his and with her work on medieval Islamic medicine uh, had become on her right a respected scholar. The tone in which Strauss addresses Krauss bears witness to their great, to their great friendship. It reaches how he addresses uh, Krauss, Lieber Krauss, well, that's uh, before it's Herr Krauss, Lieber Krauss, and then it becomes Mein Lieber, and, and then all of a sudden, it, uh, as this relationship deepens, it becomes Lieber Putzi. Putzi, I mean, it's very kind of, and then he says goodbye to 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 to, uh, to, Stra to, to Krauss by Dein Putzi. So he calls him so uh, Strauss calls him a Putzi, and and Krauss is Putzi. So you see, this is a family that goes very well together. It's very touching to 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 see this. As I said, is sometimes you read these letters and you know how the, the drama behind these people, and then nevertheless they can they have this sense of humor. It's really unbelievable, very touching. More than that, even in the light of this warm tone, it comes as no surprise that Strauss asks Krauss not only in academic matters for help, for help, but 
as the situation in Europe becomes increasingly precarious and he has not yet a way out anywhere else, also in practical matters for help. So in a plea from the 1st of uh, February, 1937, to find for him and his wife a safe haven in Egypt, which is Misraim in, in, in Hebrew, and, and Egypt, of course, is Masra in Arabic, Misraim. So remember Misraim, and I say that afterwards. Aber noch eine Frage eines gebrannten Häschens. Wie kommen wir denn nach Misraim rein? Gibt es denn nicht so ohne weiteres ein Päschen? Ich meine ein Visumchen? Ich wohle, ich wiederhole. Ihr habt uns einen riesen, riesen Mahlstein vom Herzen genommen. Ein ägyptisches Traumbild hat uns. Und nur für den Augenblick die Silja des Konzentrationslagers und die Charibides der jüdischen, and here I don't quite understand is the, 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 the word he uses because he writes here on the on the on the on the, at the edge of the page, the typewritten page, something by by handwriting. But I mean, I think he said that Sheribid is the Jewish Talfahrt. Uh, I start to say, nur für den Augenblick die Silja des Konzentrationslager, I, I repeat, und die Sheribid ist der jüdischen Talfahrt und dem kaum weniger quälenden Albdruck Bartos to get rid of me, beständig ausübt vom Hals äh, unserer Gedanken geschafft. Uh, Al Barker uh, is at that time a professor of political science at uh, Cambridge University and as such uh, he's his boss. So basically he bleeds here with in this letter to just say in a few words uh, in, in English, uh, in very in a, in a very in very witty tone, uh, but also a very sad tone, he's uh, he's Frank Kraus to help him to make it over to 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 eat to Egypt, which is uh, and uh, so he says he's between the, the horror of concentration camp, but he's and also for some kind of a hopeless uh, Jewish situation, uh, and then he has a boss uh, Barker in uh, at University of Cambridge who also wants to get rid of him. So this long, now I quote closed, this long and artful sentence is more than a cry for help. By invoking a big dream, Strauss lets Krauss known how much he hoped to work in Cairo, a city in which the much admired Maimonides had many years before, centuries before even, spent some of his most productive years. Quote, mon cher ami et pro frère, je pose tout mes espoirs de rester sur toi et le coeur, he writes. Clearly, at this stage, not Palestine, where the two Zionist movements struggled with internal contradiction, rising opposition by a native Arab population seemed to have been the promised land, nor was the promised land uh, in the eyes of many elitist Europeans, like Strauss was, so, uh, as at that time as, as somehow considered U.S. was kind of uh, Philistine U.S. was not the dream. Egypt was the place where he wanted to move. On February 23rd, 1935, he writes, quote, Mein lieber Strauss, da erfahre ich, dass ich wahrscheinlich doch in die USA fahren muss. Muss vielleicht. It's just like he had to go to the U.S., which is later on, of course, the place where he became an incredibly important figure, which was really good to him. But for, at that time, even in the 1930s, he, he feels like he was a forced e exile in the U.S. And of course, he also, uh, in one letter, he also has to think, I mean, moving to, to Palestine. But of course, there was not, not much of an existence waiting for him. So he, he, he thinks about what he could do there. And he said, well, he, they might, he and his wife might open a hotel and he would do the bookkeeping. And uh, during the day and the night, he would work on his manuscript. So but anyway, so USA and Palestine is our only, our only second choice. Egypt is number one. At this point, one is tempted to deliberate the question of what would have become of Straussianism had Strauss made career in a Muslim land. Muslim land, Egypt. To answer this, let's shift away from Strauss towards uh, towards Kraus. Egypt was in the mid-1930s for an exiled Jewish scholar, 
not only because of institutes of higher learning uh, and attractive of, uh, of, of attractive employment uh, uh, interesting, but of course it was also uh, a place which was considered the cradle of Mediterranean culture. From the shores of the Nile, not only the exodus to the promised land set out, but the same soil God gave his chosen people, the Torah, as well as the covenant. As reader of Herodotus, Strauss must also have been aware that important parts of antique Greek culture were derivatives from ancient Egypt. Plato's Republic, with its philosopher king, its elite guardians, as well as its strict discipline, was much modeled on the pharaonic state. This answers, of course, somehow the question, why both the Communist Party of China as well the US national security apparatus are very much influenced by Strauss's take of Plato's Republic. Both organizations are control freaks. They are they're, they're part of the big military industrial complex that is surrounded by a priestly class. And let me say that here to talk to you, which is this priestly class, which is uh, which is, comes from academics in elite universities and think tanks. So I guess Strauss thought of himself as, as also some kind of a high priest in this, uh, in this Republic uh, of Plato. And in a way he became a high priest uh, once he was uh, very well established in the United States. The question of what would have become of Strauss and his work had he moved to Cairo is somehow answered by, the, by, by, Krauss, by Krauss's later fate. This is no idle question since it must have been affected Strauss's later writing as well. Krauss himself was in the mid 1930s well, still a well established professor of Semitic language at Cairo University but dark clouds were already looming over the horizon. Still, the European academics in Egypt, uh, became, yeah, so e European academics in Egypt became from the second half of the decade, 1930s, increasingly marginalized. This not only by the rise of Muslim fundamentalists, but also ultra-right nationalist forces. At the same time, uh, by Strauss, by keeping a certain, by, no, Klaus, by keeping a certain distance from Zionism, he fell in a fracturing Middle East and literally, Middle East, literally between the chair and the bench. So, but first, what went right for Klaus and would have become right for, for, for Strauss had he followed him, at least in the beginning of his day in Egypt? And second, what went terribly wrong later on? The Prague-born Krauss studied at the local German university in Prague, Semitic language from where he went 1926 to what was at the time British administer of Palestine. But disagreements with the Zionist movement, as well as the, at that time only very limited choice at the at time still very small Hebrew university, prompted him to move 1927 to Berlin, where he studied the language and history of ancient Assyria and Babylonia. Shortly after Hitler's rise to power, he, he moved to Paris, where he found in the person of Louis Matignon, Massignon, Louis Massignon, a Catholic scholar of the Arabic culture and early pioneer of Muslim Christian dialogue, a protector. But since Krauss lacked French citizenship, he could not find permanent academic employment on this soil. But Massignon recommended him to the Egyptian writer and scholar Dao Hussein, who interestingly was somehow like Strauss, very much inspired by Plato, Plato in his ideas. As dean of the faculty of language at Cairo University, Hussein hired Krauss 1936 as professor of Semitic languages. A negligent local monarchy combined with a relatively mild quasi-British, quasi-colonial rule guaranteed, guaranteed at that time for an open intellectual atmosphere in which independent scholarship, relatively free newspapers and creative artistic movement, movements could prosper. 
the cultural and political movement, El Nachta Masra, or the awakening of Egypt, Renaissance Egypt, wanted to bring this country back to, to its long last strength. In this very spirit, Cairo University was founded in 1908, where other than at the most almost thousand year older, Al-Azhar University Arabic was taught not based on its strict grammatical rules of the Quran, but modern Western linguistic. But the, of this triggered, of course, a cultural cl a clash of civilization, in the midst of which a foreign Arabist like Krauss found himself himself in himself in. Was, was uh, Dao saying wanted to reorient Egypt not only away from the strict Islam of the Arab conquerors towards a pharaonic rule, from its, its pharaonic roots, but also reconnect modern Egypt, uh, modern Egypt to antique Rome and Greece. That undertaking bears, of course, striking similarities to Strauss's attempt to build a bridge from Jerusalem to Athens. Hussein's 1926 book, published book of literary criticism on pre the title on pre-Islamic poetry, Fisha Jahiliya, uh, caused a scandal not only by maintaining that much of Arab writing produced prior to, raise, uh, to the rise of Islam was at, at the later point falsified by, by the ulema, but also that the Quran was not a reliable historic source. This in turn sounds somehow similar at least was what concerns the, the linguistic side, what Krauss did with the Old Testament. Hussein's thesis angered the conservative, conservative forces since subjugating Islam to Hellenism was anathema. And although Egypt at the time was still sometimes away of the threat of a 1942 fast advancing German army in the Libyan desert, at the time of Krauss's move to Cairo, El Nada Masra and its ideals had already come under pressure. This is not only from the, from the side of political Islam of the Muslim Brothers, but also from the fascist inspired young Egypt party that harbored considerable sympathy for the Axis powers. A grave agricultural crisis that hit the poor very hard contributed, contributed to, to the deteriorate, deteriorating political environment. On top of its effects of the intensifying Arab-Jewish conflict in Palestine spilled more and more over to Egypt. From the end of the 1930s, Hussein's worldview had also shifted some of away from a, a liberal secular towards a more conservative, accommodative, accommodative position with Islam. As I, far as I understand, the same could be said about the later Strauss, the early and the later Strauss. So by, by accommodating to a chaotic system of the American populist democracy, he moved somehow away from the strict ideal of Plato's disciplined republic. The same can be said, of course, about his strong support later on of Israel, a state uh, but that by allowing its constitution exceptions for ultra-Orthodox Jews had become at least partially a theocracy. And of course, this very fact is contradicted, this, this is right now tearing Israelis, modern, today's Israeli societies apart. Egypt increasingly poisoned political atmosphere of the 1940s would ultimately result in the firing of Krauss from his position at Cairo University, what possibly also led to his violent death on October 12, 1944. Four days before the body of the not yet 40-year-old Krauss was found hanged in a closet uh, in his own flat, King Farouk dismissed the liberal leaning Prime Minister Nas Pasha. With this, Da Hussein lost his political influence. He, so Hussein personally informed his friend Krauss that he would lose his teaching position. Krauss's attempt even before to find a new existence in Jerusalem's Hebrew University became latest in September 1943, all of but hopeless after he held by invitation of Gershom Scholem, who, few years, who not a few years earlier, uh, Krauss asked to attack 
a lecture that was already one year earlier published under, in Egypt under the title La Force Littéraire des Tablettes de Tel Alamarna, in the, published in the Bulletin de l'Institut d'Egypte. The theory put forward says that the metrics in ancient Assyrian texts uh, could also found the same ones in earlier versions of the Old Testament, which should have, if true, far-reaching consequences in respect to the dating of the Old Testament and thus ultimately also on the roots of Hebrew culture. Krauss had given in Jerusalem a talk on the same topic already one year before, but this was received uh, at that time with wide skepticism, skepticism, if not with outright ridicule. In a letter addressed a few months after this uh, lecture he gave, in uh, the first lecture he gave in Jerusalem, he wrote, uh, Klaus wrote to Sholem that he actually had corroborated his, his, his theory. He writes him, Tout s'effondre, il ne prestera pas une pierre sur l'autre. So, like basically, he completely deconstructs uh, whatever is of, 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 uh, of, 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 of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. At the time in Zion, he struggled not only with external enemies for a homeland, but also had to find a common ground, a common Jewish ground. Uh, a central institution like the Hebrew University could uh, hardly find or accommodate space for an iconoclast mind like Krauss. So that was his, the end of his hope to, to move to, uh, to Jerusalem. And then uh, there was, of course, at that time in Palestine, a growing Arab opposition against Jewish immigration that was going on hand in hand with an increasing polarization with the, within the Yusuf itself. Sholem himself wrote in a letter, and this is called, I quote from his published letters, Sholem's Kabli in November 11, 1941, that he feared Zionist extremists could lead, uh, extremists could lead to inner Jewish civil war. And then the full horror of the Nazi dead camps at that time, all this takes place at the same time, just began to fully a sinking. On top of this, so uh, Krauss is, uh, loses any hope to move to Jerusalem. He has lost his job there. Uh, this the whole. This is the, the war is not over. The the, 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 the real, the, the true. I mean, the extent of the horror of the, of the death camps. So, uh, in there, stood Krauss. On top of it, he had Krauss had left had, had lost 1942. Uh, his wife during giving a birth to a girl child in 1942. So Krauss's lifeless body was discovered by Cecil Hurani, who like his brother, the historian Albert, the historian of the Middle East, Albert Hurani was stationed as British officer in Cairo. Both of them stayed as lodgers in Krauss's spacious apartment in Zamalek's Ahmed Hesma Street. Uh, Cecil later wrote, wrote in his memoirs, it looked like a story of a Jewish refugee from Europe uprooted from his native city and intellectual milieu, forced in a milieu where he had few friends to share his ideas and anxious, wrote Cecil. The reason of the violent death was never fully cleared, but much speaks for suicide. In the local media of that time, al which I actually had a look, there was no mentioning uh, of, of a crime uh, that there would, have, would be a foul uh, game, there would be a crime involved with his death. But nevertheless, Derek circulates an alternative story about Krauss's end, that sad end, that even if not true, highlights somehow how hopeless the situation was in which Krauss found him seeing selfie. It's worthwhile telling. Well, it, for one reason, actually, in Wikipedia, the last 12 months or so, there's actually a battle going on on who, how Krauss died. For one year ago, when I first looked it up, it, the entry said uh, it, was, uh, it was murder. Then by mid, mid, mid last year, all of a sudden, it said it was suicide. And now, 
both entries are there, murder and suicide. So it just shows how relevant still what's going on at that time uh, uh, was uh, is still somehow relevant for some people. And of course, it's interesting to tell the alternative story of uh, how uh, poor Krauss uh, could have gone from this world. Because in a way, it enters in a very tragic, ironic way, this thing which is was the, how uh, both of them worked on manuscripts. You have, you have a, an exoteric, the open meaning of something, and then you have, of course, the esoteric meaning. So I'm now talking uh, the esoteric side of it. The noted Egyptian philosopher, Abdel Rahman Badawi, connects in the Arab language encyclopedia, Musawa Mustashirin, Encyclopedia of Orientalists, the murder of his teacher and friend with the assassination of Lord Moin on the hands of the Zionist extremist group Lihi, better known as the Stern Gang. Moin was at the time of his killing, minister resident in Cairo for the Me Me Middle East in Churchill's wartime cabinet, and had in that capacity blocked Jewish immigration to Palestine. Uh, by the way, but, uh, it's also interesting, I mentioned this here because I talk uh, at, the, at, the, at your very distinguished institution. I've, thank you for the invitation. By the way, but was, was one of the most prodigious students of Alexander Coyer, is a Hegelian, Alexander Coyer. And Alexander Coyer worked between 1952 and 62 at the IIS in Princeton, as it is where institute where you now sit. Only five days lies between the two violent deaths. Moin was shot on November 6th, 1944, in front of his Cairo residence that lies only a few hundred meters apart, not only from Krauss's flat, but also from the place where Strauss's letters are kept today. According to Badawi, Krauss returned to Cairo from Jerusalem shortly uh, and before his death and must have somehow known of the plan to assassinate Moin. Krauss, according to Badawi again, thus ended up on a hit list. With his dead, Strauss's letter became somehow orphans, which brings us to the questions of how they could have ended up at the Swiss Institute that lies up. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's just beside a few hundred meters, you can walk in two minutes for, to, 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 to Ahmed Hismet Street of, the yet, of, of Krauss, who died of not yet 40 years old. Its director, the, uh, uh, the director of the Institute, Cornelius von Pilgrim, says that there are no records of how the papers have found their way to the present location. That they came there just because of the geographic closeness uh, can hardly be the reason alone. So I just I used to be my journalistic investigative. Uh, spirit, so I, I looked for for possible hints. One of them, possibly uh, key to enigma, enigma, could be the Egyptian Egyptologist Bernard Gritzelov, Gritzelov, G R D S E L O F F, who in nineteen in the nineteen thirties was hired by the founder of the Institute for Egyptian Bauforschung Urkunde as an assistant. Gritzelov according to one source was of Georgian origin, died 1950 in Cairo. He was at the time, uh, he was, uh, he, uh, he, he, he married uh, Dorothee Metlitsky, who actually, Dorothee Metlitsky, she German born, uh, who Krauss himself got married after the tragic death of his wife in 1942. So, uh, so after uh, Bettina Strauss Klaus died, uh, a year or two later, he, he married uh, Metlitsky. Uh, I assume that via the constellation Klaus Metlitsky Retzloff, who worked at that institute, the papers found their way there. But as I said, this is only a, a hypothesis. I happily stand corrected. Metlitsky became later in her life a specialist of medieval English at the leading, Ameri at leading American universities. But before that and after the first Israel-Arab world war, 
1948, she worked for the Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs at the Labor Department Movement Histralut. With the immense political tribulation of those times, especially 1948, uh, the bridge between Cairo and Jerusalem broke down, which is a likely reason why Strauss's letters were somehow left behind alone on the shores of the Nile. This is actually a fitting location for them. This not only because Krauss had been buried, has been buried at Cairo's oldest Jewish cemetery, Al Basatin, but also since much of Jewish and Greek culture is associated, associated with Egypt. These lasting roots are acknowledged on Strauss's tombstone, whose inscription cites Psalm 114 that begins with, when Israel came out of Egypt. Thank you very much.